When a criminal defendant is found guilty, either through a plea or after a trial, it may seem like the case is over. But one critical aspect of the criminal process remains, sentencing. Guilt has been established, but the question of the appropriate punishment must be resolved. So if you're a prosecutor who obtains a guilty plea or a verdict, or a defense attorney on the other side of that case, you can't relax quite yet. A key part of your job still remains. There are usually several different goals in every criminal sentencing. One is simply punishment, also called retribution or just desserts. Society punishes the offender for conduct that seriously breached the community's laws and norms. Another goal is deterrence, trying to send a message so the crime won't be repeated. And this includes both general deterrence, trying to discourage other similarly situated individuals from engaging in the same crime, and specific deterrence, trying to discourage this particular defendant from doing the same thing again. Another goal of criminal punishment in some cases is incapacitation, getting a dangerous person off the streets to protect the community. Now, this is most often thought of in connection with violent criminals, not in white collar crime. Although you could certainly argue that one reason to lock up a serial fraudster could be to protect the community by ensuring that others are not similarly defrauded. Yet another goal of sentencing has been rehabilitation. The idea that while in prison, the defendant will learn some usable skills, receive some counseling, or otherwise turn his life around so he's less likely to offend in the future. And finally, a goal of sentencing in some cases can be restitution, a court order that the defendant must pay to help make some of his or her victims whole. When it comes to deciding on the appropriate sentence, primary responsibility falls not to the executive branch that prosecuted the case, but to the judicial branch in the form of the federal judge. In any criminal sentencing, the judge seeks to come up with the right sentence for the particular defendant and particular crime before the court. This has always been considered a key part of the judicial role and one of the most difficult. The federal statute, Title 18, United States Code Section 3553, sets forth the factors a judge is to consider when imposing a sentence, including the goals that I just discussed. In federal criminal cases, any discussion of sentencing has to focus primarily on the federal sentencing guidelines. Now, Congress passed the Sentencing Reform Act that created the guidelines in 1984, and the guidelines went into effect three years later. Congress was motivated primarily by concerns about sentencing disparity. Historically, if a criminal statute carried a maximum penalty of, say, 20 years, a judge could sentence a defendant convicted of that crime to anything from probation, no prison time at all, to the maximum sentence of 20 years in prison, or anything in between. Now, where that sentence should fall was left largely up to the judge's discretion. Now, the judge ideally would consider all the circumstances of the case, the defendant's criminal record, and any other aggravating or mitigating circumstances the judge might deem relevant to the sentencing decision. But in the end, the judge had a great deal of leeway and was not required to say much about why he or she arrived at the sentence announced. But of course, judges are human. And they have different life experiences, different views about the law, different philosophies concerning criminal punishment, and even different biases. And that can lead to disparity in sentencing. So for example, a defendant convicted of bank fraud in Nebraska, whose case lands before a particularly strict judge, and a defendant convicted of the same crime with similar facts in New York, whose case is before a judge who sees such cases as routine and not all that serious, could end up facing dramatically different sentences. Well, this kind of disparity in punishment raises serious concerns for any system of justice. Elementary fairness and the rule of law require that similarly situated individuals should be treated in a similar fashion. And thus the idea of the sentencing guidelines was born. The guidelines provide a detailed set of rules for evaluating every criminal case, assigning point values for different characteristics of both the offense and the offender. And properly applied, they result in defendants who commit similar crimes and have similar criminal records receiving very similar punishments 
regardless of who their judge is or where they're located. But there's a fundamental tension at work in any system of sentencing guidelines. The essence of judging, many would argue, is the judge's ability to strive to do individual justice by fashioning an appropriate sentence. But the trade-off for that kind of discretion is the risk of disparity and the potential unfairness that may result. And when the guidelines were first enacted, they swung the pendulum dramatically away from judicial discretion and toward uniformity in sentencing. And to achieve this, the guidelines were made mandatory. Once the sentence was calculated, the judge was required to impose the resulting sentence, with very limited exceptions. But this caused controversy of its own. Many people, including probably most judges, felt that the human discretion necessary to fashion a truly just sentence had been replaced by a rigid set of rules and calculations. As one federal judge said to me during a sentencing, he felt that he was no longer really a judge, but had been turned into an accountant, just adding up the numbers. Now, as we'll discuss shortly, in 2005, the Supreme Court, in a case called United States v. Booker, ruled that the system of mandatory guidelines was unconstitutional. But before we get to Booker, its aftermath, and the current state of the guidelines, let's talk more generally about the guidelines and how they work. The Sentencing Reform Act created the United States Sentencing Commission, an independent agency based in Washington, D.C., and charged with creating and maintaining the guidelines. The commission is a seven-member body whose members are appointed by the president. And the commission conducts research on the use and effect of the guidelines, holds hearings, receives comments from lawyers and judges, and proposes annual amendments. The guidelines themselves are quite lengthy. And you can get the manual, which is several hundred pages long, or you can find the online version on the commission's website at ussc.gov. Any look at the guidelines should begin with the sentencing table, sometimes called the sentencing grid, which is contained in Chapter 5, Part A. And this table represents the end goal of the guidelines process. Every calculation done under the guidelines is in order to determine where on the table a case falls. And once you've done these calculations, they take you to a position on the sentencing table that gives you the appropriate sentence for that case. The table has a horizontal and a vertical axis. And the vertical axis represents the offense level, represented by a number from 1 to 43. And this level is calculated based on the nature and characteristics of the particular crime in question. The higher the offense level, the more serious the crime and the higher the range of recommended sentences will be. The horizontal axis represents the defendant's criminal history or criminal record, represented by a Roman numeral from 1 to 6. Again, this level is calculated by using rules provided by the guidelines and based on the individual defendant's record. So this represents the commission's recognition that a judge has always taken a defendant's criminal record into account when fashioning a sentence and that it's appropriate to do so. A defendant with a more serious criminal record will have a higher criminal history number further to the right on the axis, and that will result in a higher sentence. A first-time offender will have a criminal history category of one, resulting in the lightest sentence for a given offense level. Well, the sentencing table thus embodies the two key components in fashioning any sentence. The nature of the offense, represented by the vertical axis and offense level, and the offender's record, represented by the horizontal axis and the criminal history category. And when you've calculated those two numbers, you go to the spot on the table where they intersect, and that gives you a range of possible sentences, expressed in months. As you would expect, if you're higher and further to the left in the table, the numbers are smaller, with the lowest being a sentencing range of only zero to six months. And as you move down and to the right, meaning that the offense is getting more serious and the criminal record more extensive, the numbers get larger and larger, with the maximum being life in prison. I should mention a few other important notes about the sentencing reform that accompanied the creation of the guidelines. Now, one is that parole was abolished in the federal system. This had been another source of potential disparity. Even if two defendants received a similar sentence for the same crime, one might later be paroled and have his sentence dramatically reduced. So under the guidelines, the sentence you get is the sentence you serve, with a relatively slight reduction for good behavior being the only exception. 
If you look at the sentencing table, you'll also see that it's divided into four zones, labeled A through D, that proceed in sort of a staircase pattern through the table, proceeding up and to the right. And these zones represent the type of sentence a judge is allowed to impose. If your calculated sentencing range falls into zone A, the judge has the option to give you probation, or zero months in prison. And you'll see that every sentencing range within zone A is zero to six months. Only if you fall into zone A is probation an option, and zone A is not very big, encompassing only very minor offenses. If your calculated guideline range falls into zone B, the judge has the option of sentencing you to a halfway house, home detention, or some other lesser form of confinement, rather than federal prison. If you fall into zone C, the judge can impose a split sentence, with half of the sentence served in federal prison and the other half by some form of community confinement. For example, this is the kind of sentence received by Martha Stewart after her convictions for false statements and obstruction of justice. Her calculated sentence put her in zone C with a range of 10 to 16 months. And the judge sentenced her to 10 months with five months in federal prison and the other five served by home detention, which prompted more than one observer to say that they too would like to be sentenced to home detention at Martha Stewart's estate. Now, the great majority of the table is made up of sentences that fall into zone D. If your sentence is in zone D, then all of your time must be served in federal prison. No halfway house, no home detention. And the Bureau of Prisons will decide what kind of facility you'll be sent to, from minimum security, sometimes derisively referred to as club fed, to maximum security but all of your time will be served in a federal prison. Now, how does the judge do the actual calculations that determine where on the sentencing table a particular case falls? Let's begin with calculating the spot on the vertical axis, the offense level. Chapter two of the guidelines manual contains the primary guidelines used to calculate the offense level. Every federal crime, other than very minor misdemeanors, has a corresponding guideline used to calculate sentences for that offense. And chapter 2 is divided into subparts, designated by letter, that apply to various categories of offenses. And the rules contained in chapter 2 are the primary way we find that offense level number that determines our spot on the vertical axis in the sentencing table. So let's say you're a defense attorney who has a client being prosecuted for mail fraud for a phony investment scheme. And you want to determine what kind of a sentence your client may be facing. Well, your first task is to figure out which guideline applies to mail fraud. Now, if you're an experienced white-collar practitioner, you would just know that it's guideline 2B1.1. But if you didn't know, you could go to an index in the guidelines manual that lists every federal crime in numerical order and look up the mail fraud statute, 18 U.S.C. 1341. And that index will direct you to the relevant guideline, 2B1.1. A guideline 2B1.1 does not apply only to mail fraud. If each of the thousands of federal crimes had its own unique guideline, the guidelines manual would be truly enormous. Instead, types of crimes that share some common characteristics also share the same guideline. So 2B1.1 applies to a wide range of fraud type offenses and similar property crimes. And once we know we're within the right guideline, we can start doing our calculation. Every guideline begins with a base offense level. In 2B1.1, we see that the base offense level is 7, if the crime of conviction is punishable by 20 or more years in prison. Otherwise, it's 6. So mail fraud's a 20-year felony, so our starting level is 7. And the rest of the guideline then consists of a number of factors to be considered that potentially add points to the starting base offense level. And this is how the guidelines seek to distinguish the many different cases that may fall within the same criminal statute. Mail fraud, for example, could be the charge of conviction for everything from a small $10,000 fraud case with a single victim to something on the scale of the Bernie Madoff case involving billions of dollars and thousands of victims. Obviously, those two cases don't deserve the same sentence, even though they may involve the same criminal statute. So by applying the different specific offense characteristics within each guideline, Different cases are distinguished from each other and are essentially sorted based on their seriousness. So if we proceed through the 2B1.1 guideline, we see that points can be added for things like the number of victims, 
and whether the crime involved particularly sophisticated means, such as using offshore or shell entities. But for any fraud case, which means that for many of our white collar cases, the greatest driver of the offense level is the dollar amount of loss caused by the crime. And this is reflected at the top of the guideline in what is often called the fraud table. For the white collar practitioner, this table is often the key in any sentencing calculation. It requires you to add points to the base offense level that correspond to the loss caused by the offense. The greater the loss, the higher number of points. And this is where our minor $10,000 fraudster primarily gets distinguished from Bernie Madoff. The $10,000 loss will result in an increase of only two points. But fraud on the level of Madoff's will result in an increase of 30 points, immediately catapulting you into the highest sentencing ranges. Some guidelines have a large number of specific offense characteristics to consider. 2B1.1 has 20, while some have only a handful. But in the end, whichever guideline you're using, you come out with an adjusted offense level that represents the base offense level plus any points that were added or subtracted through consideration of the different specific offense characteristics. When performing these calculations, if there's any question about whether a particular adjustment should apply, the guidelines provide detailed commentary and instructions to guide their application. After you've completed your Chapter 2 analysis, you proceed to consider whether any adjustments from Chapter 3 apply to your case. Now, chapter 3 adjustments are not offense-specific and could apply in a wide variety of cases. For example, they include adjustments that apply if a defendant obstructed justice during the investigation or prosecution of the case or if the case involved a particularly vulnerable victim or hate crime. And these adjustments can be both up and down. For example, there can be a downward adjustment if a defendant played a relatively minor role in a larger conspiracy case. Once any Chapter 3 adjustments have been considered, we're done calculating our offense level. The next step is to determine our criminal history category, the spot on the horizontal axis. And this is done by using rules contained in Chapter 4 of the guidelines. Those rules calculate criminal history by adding points for any prior convictions the defendant may have, as well as additional points if the current crime was committed while the defendant was on probation or parole or was awaiting trial for another crime. When these points are added up, they give us the defendant's criminal history category. And now that we have both our offense level and our criminal history, we can find the range of possible sentences on the sentencing table, with that range expressed in months in prison. The calculations necessary under the guidelines are made by the judge at sentencing. If there is a dispute about whether any particular adjustment or guideline factor applies, that will be resolved at a sentencing hearing, where the prosecutor and defense attorney may present arguments to the judge, and if necessary, witnesses may testify about disputed facts relevant to sentencing. And the guidelines spell out what information a judge is supposed to consider during this process. One of the most important requirements is called the relevant conduct rules. Those rules require the judge to consider not only the specific facts that led to the defendant's conviction, but also any other facts that are part of the same course of conduct or pattern of crime, as well as actions by any co-conspirators or others who took part in the crime with the defendant. In other words, the judge is not supposed to consider only the narrow facts that led to this particular conviction, but all of the other surrounding facts and circumstances related to that crime all of the relevant conduct. Once again, this is merely the guidelines codifying what judges have basically always done. Before the guidelines, a judge was free to consider all of the defendant's relative acts and circumstances to decide what sentence was appropriate. And this is sometimes called real offense sentencing. The sentence is based on the reality of what the defendant did, not on some artificially narrower set of facts that may have formed the basis of a plea bargain. And the guidelines seek to continue this practice by instructing the judge to consider all relevant conduct surrounding the offense of conviction. In white-collar cases, the relevant conduct rules are particularly important when it comes to determining the amount of loss. And you recall that much of the sentence under the fraud guideline is driven by the dollar amount of the loss. And under the relevant conduct rules, the judge must consider all the loss caused by the defendant's conduct, not merely that to which he's pleaded guilty. Suppose, for example, a defendant engaged in a similar fraud scheme 10 times with 10 different victims, and each victim lost 
A prosecutor might agree to let the defendant plead guilty to only one or two counts of mail fraud as part of a plea bargain. But at sentencing, under the relevant conduct rules, the judge will take the total amount of the loss into account and use the total figure of $1 million when calculating the sentence. So the sentence is based on the real offense, whether the defendant is convicted of all 10 counts at trial or is allowed to plead guilty to only a single count. Is it fair to sentence someone based on conduct beyond the specific facts involved in the crime of which he was convicted? Well, again, judges have always had the power to do that to some degree, although we'll see that the Supreme Court eventually found this problematic, at least in the context of mandatory sentencing guidelines. You also might be wondering why anyone would ever plead guilty. If the same conduct will be used to calculate the guidelines range anyway, what benefit is there to a guilty plea? And the answer is that the guidelines include an incentive to plead guilty by providing the def a defendant who accepts responsibility, which usually means pleading guilty, can obtain a two or three level reduction in her offense level, which will reduce the possible sentence. And this reduction for acceptance of responsibility is the primary motivation to plead guilty under the guidelines. And particularly for serious crimes, this can make a significant difference, reducing the recommended sentence by years. We've been talking primarily about how the guidelines determine the appropriate prison sentence for an individual defendant. And we should note that the guidelines also provide similar rules used for calculating criminal fines and restitution and for calculating the appropriate sentence for corporations convicted of a crime. As I mentioned earlier, for about the first 20 years of their life, the guidelines were mandatory. Once the judge calculated the correct spot on the sentencing table, the judge was required to impose a sentence within that specified range. And this was the primary way that the guidelines reduced sentencing disparity. Like cases were treated alike. The only exception was if the judge found that the defendant qualified for something called a departure. Now, the departure rules, an entire subsection of the guidelines, describe narrow circumstances under which a case that is truly exceptional or unusual might justify a sentence outside the prescribed guideline range. Departures were rare and difficult for a defendant to obtain, as they had to be. And if judges were free to depart routinely, that would reintroduce sentencing disparity and undermine the entire purpose of the guidelines. The most important departure was for substantial assistance, which allowed the judge to grant a below-guideline sentence to a defendant who cooperated with the government in the investigation and prosecution of other offenders. So through that provision, the guidelines provided a very pro-prosecution incentive to defendants to cooperate with law enforcement as a way to get out from under their mandatory guideline sentence. The judge makes the necessary findings to apply the guidelines at a sentencing by a preponderance of the evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt. And this is the detail that got the mandatory guidelines into trouble. So let's return now to the case I mentioned earlier, United States versus Booker. The defendant, Freddie Booker, was convicted of possession of crack cocaine with the intent to distribute. The evidence at trial, where he was convicted by a jury, showed that Booker had possessed 92 grams of crack. However, at his sentencing, the government introduced evidence that he had also possessed an additional 556 grams and also that he had obstructed justice during the investigation. And the judge agreed. So under the relevant conduct rules, that meant the additional drugs were also used to calculate Booker's guideline sentence. That finding by the judge, along with the Chapter 3 adjustment for obstruction of justice, meant that Booker's minimum guideline sentence increased from just under 22 years to 30 years in prison. The Booker appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. He argued that the guidelines were unconstitutional because they resulted in a mandatory sentence based on facts found only by a judge. And relying on an earlier Supreme Court case called Apprendi versus New Jersey, Booker argued that any facts that increase a defendant's mandatory sentence had to be found by a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. To allow them to be found by a judge by merely a preponderance of the evidence, Booker argued, violated his Sixth Amendment right to a trial by jury. And by a 5-4 majority, the Supreme Court agreed. Because the guidelines are mandatory, the court ruled, a defendant was entitled to have any facts that determined the guideline sentence found by a jury. Now, the dissenting justices disagreed and argued that under the guidelines, a judge was simply doing what judges have always done, 
basing the sentence on all relevant facts and circumstances, not just the facts of conviction. And that as long as the statutory maximum sentence prescribed by Congress was not being increased, the Sixth Amendment was not implicated. But that argument did not carry the day. And so then the question became, what's the proper remedy? Now, one solution would have been to say that prosecutors have to submit all relevant guidelines questions, such as the total quantity of drugs or money involved, or other enhancements, such as whether the defendant obstructed justice, to the jury, and have the jury decide those facts beyond a reasonable doubt, along with the primary questions of guilt or innocence. But the court took a different path. It struck the portion of the sentencing law that made the calculated guideline sentence mandatory. If the guidelines were merely advisory rather than mandatory, the court held, there would be no Sixth Amendment problem because the judge would still have the discretion not to impose the higher sentence. So nearly 20 years after they were first enacted, the sentencing guidelines went from being mandatory to merely advisory. A judge now is not required to follow the recommended guidelines range. On appeal, a sentence outside the guidelines range will still be upheld if the Court of Appeals determines that overall the sentence is reasonable. Now, every federal sentencing still begins with a guidelines calculation, and the judge is still required to consider them. But now that the guidelines are advisory rather than mandatory, sentencing practice has shifted again. In that tension that we discussed earlier between discretion and disparity, Booker tipped the scales back in the direction of judicial discretion. And judges now have a great deal more leeway to depart from the guidelines. But of course, that comes at the cost of increased sentencing disparity. This increased discretion can lead to some controversial sentences, particularly in white-collar cases where judges historically have often tended to be more lenient. For example, Paul Manafort, President Trump's former campaign manager, was convicted by special counsel Robert Mueller's prosecutors in federal court in Virginia for tax fraud and other charges related to his lobbying work for Ukraine before he joined the Trump campaign. His guidelines calculations called for a sentence of 19 to 24 years in prison. But in a widely criticized decision, the judge in Manafort's case sentenced him to only 47 months. And the judge commented that, apart from his decade of financial fraud, Manafort had led an otherwise, quote, exemplary life. Which brings to mind the old line, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? There have been calls since Booker to reform the guidelines system and try to inject some uniformity back into the sentencing process. But those efforts have not gone anywhere, and the current system of advisory guidelines remains. And given that law and judging are human processes, that may actually be the best overall result. The advisory guidelines provide a uniform approach so that similarly situated defendants will generally start from the same base point. But the judge now has more leeway to exercise that traditional judicial power to take the individual defendant's circumstances into account. It's not a perfect system and will lead to some controversial sentences, but the mandatory guidelines took perhaps too much of that human element out of judging. Law, after all, is not mathematics or physics. The judge, like the other participants in the process, is a human being and has a human role to play. In any given case, we can only hope and expect that the judge fulfills his or her role with humility, integrity, and wisdom. And with that, just as a sentencing concludes a criminal case, this lecture concludes our course. Thank you for joining me in our study of this fascinating area of the law. And due to its location at the intersection of business, politics, and law, an understanding of white-collar criminal law is important to understanding many of the headlines we see every day. As we've seen, unlike crimes such as robbery, burglary, or homicide, white-collar crimes involve fuzzier concepts such as fraud or corruption and raise difficult issues about where to draw the line between conduct that may be merely sleazy, unethical, or unseemly, and conduct that is truly criminal. Well, human nature and human history suggest that regardless of where those lines are drawn, there will always be people who are willing to skate right up to them and those who are willing to jump across. And those who do cross the line will find federal prosecutors, 
and the federal criminal justice system waiting on the other side, ready to enforce society's rules through the investigation and prosecution of federal white-collar crime.